But you guys are gonna get a green van and a talking dog and solve it? You have a piece of eardrum on your shoulder. Compound B. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe you're an idiot. You're in over our heads. Bees? Welcome to Compound B, a show about the boys. I am Jamie G. Esquire V, and no, I cannot defend you in a court of law. Can't do it, won't do it. But I am here with Magna Mills to talk about the latest episode of Gen V, a spinoff of the boys. And you know what? Congratulations to Gen V for getting renewed for season two. We will absolutely be ready whenever it comes out, and we'll be doing it right here on Compound B. Ain't that right, my man Mills? Yes, sir. Dean Kane, sir. Ready, willing, able, and consenting. I am Magna Mills, and thank you for consenting to check out Compound B, a show about the boys. Again, find us wherever you get your pods and on YouTube. You can find us on social media at Compound B Pod. Do not forget to get that consent and do not forget the flaps. Follow, like, and please subscribe. Helps other people find our show, find our channel. We really super duper appreciate it very, very much. Thank you. If you have fun, please click the thumb. If there's one thing you have to know before we go any further, it is that this is a full-on spoiler show for both the boys and Gen V alike. All released episodes of both shows, as well as the boys' comics, are all fair game for discussion here. And if you don't know, now you know. This is Jumanji, Season 1, Episode 60, six overall episode of Gen V, originally released October 20th, 2023 on Prime Video. Directed by Rachel Goldberg. Written by Lauren Greer. Special guest stars include Jensen Ackles as Soldier Boy. Guest starring Patrick Schwarzenegger as Golden Boy. Marco Pigosi as Dr. Edison Cardosa. Andy Walken as Dusty. Ty Barnett as Malcolm Moreau. Miata Ad Labile as Jackie Moreau. And Clancy Brown as Professor Rich Brinkerhoff. Now, a word from Gen V. The Godolkin University School of Crime Fighting is excited to announce its newest course offering, The Psychology of Supervillains. By studying the most well-known example of a supervillain, Soldier Boy, the course will investigate what makes a hero go bad from their flawed origin story to the vices and moral compromises that lead them astray. Space is limited. Sign up today. And since we're doing the college thing... Uh, while we cover Gen V, we're going to reminisce and we're going to kick things off with some shots. Mills, remind us how shots, S-H-O-T-S, remind us how it works. I swear, I just can't ever remember. I know, right? It's just like you start and then all of a sudden it's, what are you doing here, sir? Where are your clothes? You're streaking through the quad. I mean, it's just... It's a Wendy's. I mean, it's, it's who knows. It's just how it happens. You just all of a sudden you're right there getting the bag. You know, how did I get here? What's going on? Uh, anyway, we're going to do some shots here to give you our initial feelings about Jumanji episode six using roughly the same process you use in college to decide whether or not you're going to class. When you wake up in the morning, you got to make a decision about class, right? Just like the episode, if you're not feeling it, you're skipping it. If, if you thought it was decent enough and you care enough about the class, you're probably hitting snooze but you're getting there eventually. And if you love it, you are on time. You are an on-time student. You are there before the class starts. You are ready. You are excited. You are pumped for the next one. Jamie G, you're the first victim for shots here. Show us how it's done. Good, not great for me. I'm hitting snooze, but I'm there pretty soon. And I think that's kind of been a runner throughout this uh, this season so far is most of these episodes I'm super into and I don't want to like totally miss it. But I'm not there five minutes early. I'm there like two minutes late. And I think this falls in line there for me. So I'm I'm hitting snooze on this one. Yeah, I think I'm in the same place with you. I'm hitting snooze. I will say that I liked it better upon rewatch. There were a couple of nice little background things and other stuff going on that I missed on the first time through. It's definitely good backstory. It gives depth to the characters, all that good stuff. But it feels like after the last few episodes, we're kind of on the way to the fireworks factory. And now it's just like, hey, let's stop at Cracker Barrel for three hours or something. It's like, oh, let's just, we'll, we'll eat at the fireworks factory. Come on, dad. You know, and so a little bit of that there. I will say it was nice to get more Brink and, Sol- and Golden Boy and then obviously Soldier Boy. So like Kalisa's milkshake, this did bring all the boys to the yard at least. So I like that. I've had that going for it, which is nice. But again, probably not on that top, top tier. Uh, you know, again, not there before the bell rings or anything like that. So uh, hit and snooze. 
Well, right at the opening of the episode, Kate gives everybody their memories back, and Emma heads to the Stardust to find Sam. I normally wouldn't advocate for starting off with puppet sex, if you will, but Emma and Sam, they they don't waste much time, man. Uh, you know, there, there was a lot of B.E. here. Um, and for those of you that are just tuning in, B.E. stands for banging energy. And there was a lot of it with these two. And she kind of lost her memories and then still thought he was cute. And I, I, I saw this coming a little bit, Mills, didn't you? I mean, this it is college after all, right? I mean... Yeah, I mean, the only disappointment would probably be, like, kid and play would frown on this because there's a definite lack of foreplay. But, I mean, yeah. you can kind of understand it. It was weird that they went right to it, but it did offer some good insight, you know. And Sam got the great joke about his hand. I, I thought that was a pretty good one, his, his, the competent hand there. Uh, I thought that was great. I, I liked the way they played it. You, you know, I thought it was really kind of more, like, sweet and cute than, than anything else for the most part. And they bonded i guess the thing is did the bonding they do here was it enough to sell you on the idea that at the end of the episode he will just listen to emma because to this point it seems like he's never listened to anybody right like he wouldn't even listen to luke like did they do enough i guess to sell that that he trusts her you know more than anybody in his whole life i guess well i will say this and to be fair to the show here i think it's yes he just lost his virginity to emma and he's clearly in love with her and and all that but i will say that they set this up before this this sex scene if you will um they set it up back when he referenced multiple times you're a hero a real one you're the only one that was able to free me so they, they've been setting this up a little bit before they also used her getting big to kind of pin him down and calm him so i i think it works just because of all the work they've done you know, them kind of connecting and, and having, you know, sex basically was the, the cherry on top, I think, to, to be able to sell the fact that, like, he will listen to her um, and he will trust her. I mean, that makes sense. They just have to find time. I guess they'll get one hour a day for that kind of stuff. And then they have to keep doing the other stuff, the 23 hours of the day. So, I yeah, mean, that's all he needs. 23 seven he needs is to, about his. Yeah, he, he needs that hour off. So uh, I, I would like to see uh, that would be a fun one for the soundtrack or something like that. I think I buy it. I, I guess you have to a little bit. And I also think it comes down to Sam's at the point where he said he doesn't have anybody else, right? And he apparently doesn't. I'm, I'm assuming the parents are out of the picture one way or the other. And so it's a little bit kind of by default, but he has to trust somebody at some point, right? And she seems to be the best candidate. I think the only counterpoint, Mills, is like he's kind of also given us this little bit of personality problem where like he's – he literally can't control his own thoughts, his own mind, his own anger, his own rage, his own hallucinations, if you will. So there's a little bit of kind of like this uneasiness where at any moment he could snap. You know what I mean? So will she be able to talk him down from there? Um, I think this was a pretty good step today, but that's the only thing that's kind of looming where I'm like, well, I don't know. You know, we saw earlier in the Stardust when he freaked out, saw the, you know, the puppet uh, deep and had to basically run off to to kill the doctor and looking back you almost you almost wish they would have let him right uh now that we know what, what we know yeah you're probably not wrong on that and i feel bad like it's not if he was a human you'd be like oh he has you know like the bipolar is kind of a catch-all term is he right. by puppet like he's just in the real world and then all of a sudden <laughs> he just flips into puppet mode is he by puppet is that what it is there's something going on with the puppets. This is twice now we've seen the well, three times really. Yeah, we'll save it for this I have some puppet weird. predictions. I got some uh, some PP symbol later on. I got some. Uh, All right, well, we'll we'll save the puppet talk for a little bit later. Um, but yeah, look, I I like Sam and 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 Emma definitely shipping them, and I definitely like that they're kind of leaning on pairing those two up a little bit um in the dynamic that they bring together i think that's a really smart decision by the show so uh that gets a thumbs up for me let's move on here let's get back to dusty's uh where andre is basically well he's full-on done with kate at this point marie tries to talk him down a bit to no avail kate pushed too hard in restoring their memories and she has one of the seizures we saw her have you know, I think it was episode two um, where where she the flashlight thing with the with the cops where she saves Andre. So she has another episode. Marie uses her powers to save Kate. But then Marie, Jordan, Andre and Dusty are all transported inside Kate's cabeza. What do you think, Mills? Is this the Herman's head reboot that everyone in the world's been waiting for? Or is that just you and I? 
that is a a deep cut shout out uh yardley smith the, the voice of lisa simpson i believe start on uh herman said uh, kate's cabeza and uh, i'll allow it that's fine i i like that we get some more insight but this is a thing that's definitely been done before where people get trapped inside someone's head or, or memories or whatever it's kind of like a little bit of a writer's cheat to give you this kind of backstory and character development i i think it's fine i, I think one thing that jumped out a little bit is at least getting to kind of see the, the aftermath of that scene, you know, where Kate tells her younger brother to go away that she told us about before. And, and that's pretty harsh. Even, you know, it's pretty obvious that her mom tells the cops like, you know, I, I'm not comfortable around her. Uh, that's all pretty screwed up. And we got the little random further expansion of Marie's powers when she, I don't know, did she just do the, uh, the defibrillator thing? Did she just do a little clear or... How did she fix Kate? I know she's having a seizure. She like stabilized her heart. And she, uh, uh, it's not the, the pacemaker. I mean, uh, is that going to be the, the spinoff of the Peacemaker show? So are we going to get a crossover between Peacemaker and the and Gen V called the Pacemaker? I would love it. Just bring more John Cena, please. And Eagly. Can we just get Eagly on the, can we get Eagly on the. Eagly for sure. Uh, shout out Pace. If you haven't seen Peacemaker, go watch it. Great season one. But Mills, back to your point here, I think that the show has, I want to believe purposefully, every episode given us a, a little insight into the expansion of powers of Marie Moreau. And they are really impressive. I mean, really impressive. And every episode you got to get a little bit more of what she can do. I think in this case, they had a low pulse, um, which means low heartbeat, right? And she basically re-simulated that heartbeat and got it got it back up to a normal level to the point where she was breathing and functioning normal stuff. I mean, if she can do that, coupled with all the other stuff we've seen her do already, she her powers are way, way more than any of us imagined episode one, right? So I think that's really cool that they continue every episode to give us just a little bit more of Marie Moreau. Yeah, this is a far cry from blood ropes. Yes, dude, that, that's not even, that's like nothing. That brings us to our big cameo of the episode, the true inventor of my pillow, Soldier Boy. <laughs> what do you think, Mills? Would you rather have had this been a surprise or was just, you know, kind of subverting uh, our expectations enough here with, with how they chose to use Soldier Boy? I think I would have liked it to have been a surprise. It would have been so random, but they went such another way with it. If I remember right, I think on our prediction, you said we were going to get like actual soldier boy, not even a video or something like actual soldier boy. And, you know, I think, you know, imaginary boyfriend was not on my bingo card. It was, you know, again, it was just basically a clever way of of disguising the exposition jump and the exposition dump, but it worked really well. And I thought it was great. Uh, any particular parts of it that kind of stood out for you and kind of your thoughts overall? Did you like the, the use of the soldier boy here? It definitely surprised me. I, I think they could have probably, you know, if you have a blank canvas, you can think of a lot of ways to work soldier boy in, but it just reminded me how much I love soldier boy. Like what a great character, dude. Like he, and he delivers here. A hundred percent. It also showed me what an absolute douche Andre Andre has gone to like my least favorite character by far. Um, And it's not even close anymore, but I I just, you know, anytime you give me soldier boy with those one liners, that's a, that's a win Uh, for me. It it was an interesting way to kind of use him. And it's interesting that he's been basically stuck in there, but not really because he's also been, you know, in, in the boys universe. So some questions there with, is he stuck in there? Is he just kind of like always in there for her? But so I had a little bit of questions because they were at risk of getting stuck in there. And that was kind of what hurried up the the episode a little bit as I'm trying to get out. But it it made me think is, is soldier boy like permanently stuck in there? It sounds like it, right? Yeah. This is just the case where you'll see this when they do it in other shows, you'll have characters, you know, and they will be like the id or whatever. they will be, like different parts of your consciousness and everything like that so i have no problem with it and i would say basically every line that soldier boy says is is just gold i'm kate's imaginary friend from when she was a kid boyfriend really i thought i had to jerk off well let me just see a a little would you rather i mean uh 
I'm going to give you two soldier boy lines and you tell me which one you thought was uh, funnier. What are you greasy sack of fuck nuts doing in here? Or. Boys, they come and go. But she always comes back to a little pillow talk. It really hard because they're both amazing, but I'm going to lean towards that last one just because he had set it up so many times throughout. And then to end on that, on that was just brought it full circle. Yeah. I'm going with the last one. Well, that wasn't quite the end. So all right. All right, so uh, that wasn't quite the last one. How about pillow talk versus... Yeah, knock, knock. Who's there? Go fuck your face. Closer than you think. Knock, knock. is That's a great knock, knock. I mean, that's a, that's a way up there for knock, knocks. Did you find it weird that he claims to uh, fart the Star Spangled Banner? Is that part of his superpower? I did find it weird. Um, but, you know, he's, he's red-blooded. Not like commie red, but like red, white, and blue red, you know? Yeah, I wonder what the, the hex code is for Kami Red. I, I don't know about that a uh, little bit. <laughs> Just the, the idea that the cranking up the Jonas Brothers and then Andre gets mad because he thinks that Kate hates the Jonas Brothers, so it's probably apparent that... Well, I mean, it's, it, she could have liked them when she was younger, right? I'm sure there's stuff you like when you were a kid you'd never admit to liking now or you don't like when you're an adult or whatever. But I thought that was funny when Andre was off. He's like, she doesn't like the Jonas Brothers. Well, dude, he just looked like a giant d-bag the entire time with his like jealousy of this so, like it just was so ridiculous to me and just you know it's like dude you started the episode hating her now you got this jealousy thing it we find out i know we'll talk about it a little bit later but we find out that you were basically sleeping with her while, while luke was still alive and then is then you immediately shift the blame to to marie or, or i'm sorry to, to jordan for jordan's thing like i don't know man I, i'm 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 way down on Andre after this episode. Way down. Yeah, I can feel you on that. And just shout out to Diddle the Skittle. That was a, that was a good one. Yeah, yeah, I haven't heard Diddle the Skittle. I like that. Yeah, that was a new one for me. The other stuff was pretty. And shout out, you know, I don't know where Soldier Boy is learning this new stuff or whatever. And, and it was kind of cool to see him even fake him react to being called the, like a Russian plant or whatever. And even heard that in the word for Gen V. So I think this will be part of season four of the boys where they're setting up that uh, he blew up seven tower or whatever, because he was taken over by Russia and just shout out how they killed him. I love that. He's just about to explain to them what they need to do. And he just gets killed. Uh, just heavy shades of deep blue sea where that happens to uh, Samuel L. Jackson's character, which is uh, you know, very famously referenced by uh Dave Chappelle as Samuel Jackson on Chappelle show doing the Samuel Jackson beer skin. We're going to pull together and we're going to find a way to get out of here. First, we're going to seal off this. Next, we get a scene where the first meeting between Indira and Kate takes place. How did this memory impact the way you, you feel about Kate and Indira here, man? I mean, you feel bad for Kate, right? Because we saw it when she was a little girl where her mom kind of turned from her, right? And was scared of her with the wood scene when the brother was lost. But now you realize like, I don't know, dude, like I would love to have that door on like any secret room or safe in my house. Like that thing was like Fort Knox style getting into her bedroom. And it makes you realize like she grew up without any love whatsoever from her, from her mother. And, but you also see the master master manipulation of Indira here. Yeah, I would say you, you nailed it home with both of those. Definitely just, it made me feel sorry for Kate. It made you understand yeah. a little bit why she would try to do just basically anything to please people. And it gives you an understanding of why she would do it for Indira. You know, you can make the argument maybe Indira treated herself with some drugs so she really wasn't worried about Kate being able to push her or whatever. That's why she let her touch her and the, and the hugging and everything. You do have to wonder what's in those pills that Indira gave her. But yeah, this definitely sets up Indira as being the total manipulative, like as bad as you could have imagined. And they hammer that home at the end of the episode. You know, I think it's almost the culmination of the track they've been laying for her where bit by bit we, we see how far she's willing to go. You know, what level of the game is she playing at? And she looks like she's, you know, one of the, the high level players here that's playing the, uh, you know, the four or five, six dimensional chess or what have you. Yeah. And, you know, I've been wondering for a couple episodes now if she has superpowers herself and, you know, the way she had just the way she worked Kate here was like, dude, that's a superpower in and of itself, man. I mean, she's she is really 
emerging i think throughout that throughout this episode is kind of the big bad right um so to speak for for gen v so far so um definitely an important scene there after that we get to see a memory of the first time kate met luke and this quickly turns into a revelation that kate and andre had been sleeping together before luke died were you surprised by this reveal for me i was but then upon thinking about it I guess maybe it makes sense that they waited like less than a full day to hook up after he died. Uh, makes me feel a little bit better about that, but kind of, kind of crappy here, right. To be somebody's best friend and be doing that. Yeah. 100%. But you are right. In retrospect, it makes way more sense now when they basically bang, like in the first scene, the first time they're alone after the death of golden boy, it looks like. So this tracks a, a lot better there. I did think it was cool when all of a sudden they, they don't realize they can really interact like that. And uh, Luke starts talking to Andre and also RIP Dusty, just nice when he gets just, you know, he's the one trying to get out of there and he just gets absolutely just exploded edited by golden boy. So I, I thought all that was great. And I loved uh, Dusty's little comment. Like how long has dude been going to school for? He said he's 28 or whatever. When he walks in, he's like, dude, I haven't been to class in years. Yeah, that was wild. Like, wow, this Do you think he's really dead? Like that... nowadays? Are, are you worried that that's like the last time we see Dusty? Like, did he? Oh, he's he dead. Really I'm pretty sure that's there. that's always that's the rules of those kind of episodes. If you die on the inside, you die in real life. That's like the stakes. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's a always how that Rest works. Peace, Dusty, we we enjoyed you much. I did think that was cool when he turned and and talked. Um, you know, I thought I didn't see that coming, so that was that was pretty cool. This episode feels a little bit like a soap opera because they follow up that reveal with another reveal. I mean, I wouldn't go full on Telemundo um, soap opera here, but it's close. I mean, we get a memory of Luke in Professor Brink's office and it gets heated quick. And th this isn't when Luke killed Brink, but th this is a prior confrontation where Jordan helped Brink subdue luke right and this is how jordan got the job as brink's ta this is how jordan kind of became brink's right hand then and i didn't see this coming but what were your thoughts on the scene i thought this was pretty pretty impressive part of this uh this episode here in terms of just like background it was a nice misdirect because you assume that oh we're gonna get to maybe see a little bit more of the confrontation between luke and brink and then slowly realizing as it develops, like, wait, this doesn't make sense. And then figuring out that Jordan knew that this had happened before. It is not even a given that this was the only time, I guess it was kind of just an unspecified months ago. And I think this also retroactively makes Brink look a little worse, right? Like you were like, oh, well, maybe he's not all bad. He was advocating for Jordan when no one else would and that kind of thing. And now it seems more like he was just doing the same thing everyone else was, just manipulating people for his own purposes. So, uh, you know, shout out Clancy Brown. I enjoyed seeing him again and everything. But, yeah, he came off as, you know, a bit of a creep. And you even see that kind of in the other scenes we get here where kind of Kate flashes over to the meeting she has with Brink and Indira. And they're talking about, you know, why she has to keep doing what you're doing and it's going to help her friends and this. And you get the idea. She's really not getting much out of this, right? Like just the pills and, you know, any other thoughts too on the fact that Kate can read minds? That was kind of a random thing that I would say is going to come up again. But, you know, those pills, I wonder if that'll tie into the virus thing. And, you know, I think Brink was probably right there with Indira, right? Kind of masterminding the whole thing, I think. I think so, too. I mean, you got to believe that they were all involved in this because I think they, you know, running a school filled with soups uh, with these type of personalities, you feel vulnerable that you can't control it. Right. So the number one goal had to be how do we control it? We learned at the end of this episode, maybe that's not the number one goal for Indira. Um, she might be on some like Hitler Holocaust type stuff with 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 soups, but it felt like the number one goal was to control the soups and you can understand why to a certain extent. Um, not that you would ever condone doing like twisted experiments on them or anything, but that's how they derive, you know, arrived at the, at the ability to get the, the, the information to control them. But yeah, I, I think he was definitely in on a hundred percent. I think it was kind of a team thing. Um, but you know, I'm still waiting for something else. I'm waiting for like, did Indira play a role in Luke killing Brink so that she has full control over this virus as they get close? I, you know, I'm just waiting for more to come here. 
Uh, that's what she said. But on top of that, I guess what's kind of odd for me is you have kind of negative revelations for both Andre and Jordan here, right? And Andre's was more of a personal level. It doesn't really, I think, have anything to do with kind of the ongoing mystery in the woods and everything. Whereas Jordan's reveal about Brink, you know, having been assaulted by Luke before and everything is a pretty big deal and relevant to their plot, but yet she didn't tell them about it. Yeah, I still feel like I'm kind of more mad at Andre than Jordan here. And, and do you feel the same? It feels like you kind of feel the same yeah. way, despite like theoretically Jordan having the greater transgression as far as it matters to their ongoing plot that like, I don't know, that Andre's betrayal was worse kind of. I think so, dude, because I mean, you can't really blame Jordan there. Jordan had no idea what was going on or anything. And, you know, you, you, you just can't really blame him, uh, blame them. Um, but as far as Andre's concerned, Andre made a, a calculated decision to, you know, basically, you know, sleep with his best friend's girlfriend. Yeah, that's just, you can't really, I don't know, man, that that's, that's, that's crossing a line. I think that Jordan didn't pat and cross. Jordan didn't know. Yeah, and Andre for Jordan, knew. it was more, it felt more kind of business, right? Like, just like when Marie first came in, she was trying to just do anything to to get her chance. Jordan didn't really have a fair shot any other way, so you could get why that, while well, Andre seems to be just for more selfish purposes, especially with the way season one, or excuse me, episode one kind of ended with Luke telling them that he, how much he loved him and everything. I felt like they all had this very close personal relationship, so I think that's what makes the betrayal feel worse. Yeah, to totally agree. Well, the final memory we see here is Marie's. And when she sees her sister, Annabeth, in the bloody bathroom with her dead parents, this this was just tough to watch and honestly really sad. Incredible acting by the actress that plays Marie Moreau here with the face shake and the tears and all that. It was really good. Uh, Annabeth tells her that she'll never forgive her. No matter how hard she she wants to be a hero, she'll always just be a murderer. And this leads to Marie convincing Kate to wake up and save them all. Mills, you keep predicting that we'd see Marie's sister uh, throughout this. Does this count? Or are you expecting a little bit more? Or do you think we'll get more? Technically, you could argue that this counts. I, I never specified outside of a memory or flashback, but I, I still think we're going to see her, even if it's not in season one, now that we have season two, I'm very confident we will be seeing her, so I'll say, no, this doesn't count. I'll kind of hold it for the main event, but yeah, you're right. I shout out Jess and Claire, just absolutely phenomenal acting job here, especially because she kind of knew, right? It seemed that the other two didn't quite know what they were walking into. She opened that door knowing what she was walking into, and you know, you weren't even for sure at first if that was her or her sister, and yeah, just absolutely devastating. I guess, did that give you enough to believe that Kate would let them out at that point i mean was you had you know her kind of doing that and then andre kind of you know talking to her and being like you know i want to forgive you but because i love you but i don't think i can ever forgive you and do you believe that this all was enough somehow to get kate to kind of give up on i guess basically killing herself look i guess it's enough there i mean they they, they tried to kind of establish a this is how close we all are and honestly this is another example of the show taking a real life thing that's happening in today's age, showing it, letting it play out. Right. And that's where, you know, somebody's just considering taking their own life and then a group of friends kind of brings them back. And so I thought that was kind of an interesting way, but yeah, I, th I think it's enough. I mean, look, they're all kind of in a similar situation where outside of them, who else do they have? Right. They we they made a point of showing us that all of them have issues with their parents or don't have parents at all. They all have trust issues and and like that's why they're such easy targets for Indira. But now that they found each other as this group, that's really all they have, right? So I guess in that standpoint, it makes sense. Yeah, and what's funny is you could just be describing the the boys, like the actual the boys. Yes. You could be describing them. So uh, that's kind a good of. job with that. So I, you know, and that should there should be you know thematic parallels, everything like that. And and the one thing I I guess we should ask is Marie seems to be the one most willing to forgive Kate, right? And is that because her sister wouldn't forgive her? 
is that what has kind of led her to maybe be the one that's willing to take that extra step because she wishes her sister would forgive her. So that's why she's maybe willing to forgive Kate. Whereas, you know, Jordan and Andre aren't ready to go there yet. I think so. And I also think she's just, look, man, she's the one that's, that was kind of a long shot to even get into God. You, I think she's kind of shown this whole time. She's not while she's like all the rest of them. She's really not right because of what her situation was and how different she was and she came into god you think and keep your nose down and just do everything right don't make any mistakes right so she was like she, her situation's far different than jordan's or andre's who was had kind of born with the silver spoon so to speak or golden boy who was number one or you know or even kate like so I think it's it kind of a, a wraps up into all that a little bit with with Marie. But ironically enough, every episode we're learning, she's probably the most powerful out of all of them. You don't have to have power as long as you can wield it. All right, man. Well, let's finish up with Dean Shetty and the Woods plot line here. Dr. Cadosa, we see, makes some significant progress with his virus. It can make soups uh, and only soups sick. And then we find that in larger dosha, doses, it can even kill soups. Uh, this seems to be what Indira wants. And we end the episode with her asking Dr. Cardosa if he can make the virus contagious. A, a literal killer ending, pun intended here. Uh, Mills, this was this was pretty wild, right? Yeah, we got a full-on outbreak situation, man. Somebody, uh, you know, you're not calling Ja Rule in this case. You're calling uh, Cuba Gooding Jr., I guess. Like, what does he think about this? Dustin Hoffman make an appearance here? I mean, I don't know. I think he's retiring. A lot of retiring. I can't get Kevin Spacey. It's, it's getting harder and harder to a uh, Rene Russo still out there. Though. Shout, shout out Rene Russo. Uh, probably also waiting for that Lethal Weapon 5, even though it may or may not have already been made by another show. Uh, one thing that did surprise me, it, it seems to actually make the soup sick, right? When they said virus, you kind of assume something that's almost kind of mind control or something more. It seems to just literally make them too sick to use the powers, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we saw it with lack of a better word. It was kind of like a COVID for soups, right? Like that's what it looked like in terms of the the flu like symptoms and all that. I found this interesting Mills when, when Cardoso is ready to kind of, and again, this is where the manipulation and the bigger plan and the strategy comes in with Indira and she's operating at a very high level with this. Cardoso is ready to go ahead and prepare and present to Vought she says no 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 she wanted to up the dosage and that's how we learn that when they dial in it can ap absolutely kill a soup right and we saw it it looked like a pretty gruesome death too um and it's just so interesting because cardoso is vis visibly shaken up by this you know we see him sitting outside the cell kind of like you know rocking and biting nails and nervous energy and all that and then indira walks in and she's almost like taken away with like ex excitement and like holy cow we have something powerful here and it's just so fascinating to see the two of them uh, and where they are in terms of how they react to something like this. And the, again, the bigger picture with Indira for sure. Yeah. I mean, the show hasn't really been subtle with some of their metaphors. Like they talked about a Mangala hospital under the school. That's again, a Nazi reference. And this is basically that you hear Cardoso talking about compassionately controlling the soups, like control is control, compassion or not control is control. And then when he kills the, the soup and he's talking to Indira, he straight up says, I was just following orders. So yeah, early prediction, I don't think things are going to end well for Dr. Cardosa. Oh, I don't think so either. Once, once Indira has what she needs to be able to duplicate this, he's dead. She just the way, and that's why earlier I mentioned maybe she was behind Brink, uh, Brink's uh, departure. Look, man, if she's the only one that has control of this, how much more powerful is she? So I just got to believe that she's kind of in it for herself here a little bit. Um, but yeah, this was this was a wild way to end it. One of the things we enjoy during, doing during the discussing these television shows is we come up with alternative episode titles. Gen V started out hot, but the last couple episode titles haven't been the greatest. I'm not in love with Jumanji. I think it was kind of a cheap shot. Like it had me excited because of the, the scene earlier in the episode where Kate tells uh, the Rufus to basically go get a baseball bat and and swing that bat as hard as you can into your nuts every hour on the hour and every time you swing yell Jumanji so like made you think maybe it was something to do with that it was a total curveball here Jumanji did not work for me for this episode title what about you no and 
I was even trying to figure out why. Usually there's a way you can figure out. I guess it's because they get transported into Kate's Tabesa, like kind of like how you, the, you get transported into the Jumanji game and there's they're in the woods. And that's about it. I again, yeah, probably the weakest of the episode titles so far. Um, if you want me to lead with my strong hand, yeah, my favorite alternate episode title would be Crank Up the Jonas Brothers. I think that would have been a, a very fun one. Uh just for you know, a couple other ones that might have been okay. Give me a, the competent hand. I like the competent hand. Uh maybe a little pillow talk. Pillow talk would be pretty good. And then uh maybe nice is all it takes. How about yourself? You got any else? <laughs> oh man. I it would dude, the competent hand was was my go-to there. I really really uh I, I don't have anything that would outdo any of those so well done my friend i appreciate that um let's let's go ahead and uh and move into i don't know college man let's let's uh let's dive into our most college moments from this episode titled jumanji mills what moment from this episode made you feel like you were in college again i have to say it's when whether it was you or somebody else but like a random person gets tagged in on whatever you're doing, like going to a party, going to movies, either you have your usual group and like one random person that's somehow with you, or you find yourself as the random person attached to some group going to do some random thing. And you don't really know how it kind of worked out that way, but all of a sudden it does. And that does not seem to happen very often in adult life, but that definitely happened with regular frequency in college. So just the idea that Dusty gets brought in with them and everything was just very college to me. You just accidentally kind of get swept up in someone else's adventure almost. Uh, how about yourself? What what made you feel like Ghostface style took him back to college? Yeah, man. I, I gotta say just the the you know the Emma kind of running off back and and getting what she wanted there with with Sam and then the two of them kind of coming back and you know not realizing that like like thinking that like the the other party's been there the whole time but really they were like passed out unconscious all while that was happening with sam and emma that's and then they just like wake up and like oh wow now you're here like oh thank god you guys are here it's like well we've been here you're we just like blacked out for the last like six hours or whatever so uh definitely felt a little college-ish right there that's funny for some reason i thought you were gonna go with that was gonna wind up being a sex hair thing but it still worked you have sex hair no i don't with sex hair better band name or album name band name I'm going album name, Lenny Kravitz. Ah, that's that works. That works. Uh, if you put out a new album called Sex Hair, you wouldn't, you'd be like, oh yeah, that, that tracks. I guess John Legend maybe, but I feel like Lenny Kravitz would be better. Yes. Well, this is Gen V, but the boys will be boys. Mills, what's your favorite moment in this episode that references the boys or reminds you most of the boys? I mean, it just has to be every word that came out of Soldier Boy's mouth. It's very difficult to beat that. If you wanted an honorable mention, just Dusty getting randomly blown up by Golden Boy was very boysish as well. But yeah, I mean, dude, Soldier Boy, pillow talk. What are we doing? Soldier Boy, tell him. Uh, just, just go ahead and bag that and, and call it a day. That brings us to our Gen V top three. We're each going to rank our top three characters. And, you know, now that we're two-thirds of the way done with the season here, Mills, things are getting interesting. Who is in your top three with literally just a couple episodes left to go? Yeah, just those Ackies left to go. I'm going to cheat a little bit at three. I'm going to go with Sama. That's what I'm going with as the uh, ship name for Sam and Emma. We're going with Sama, so I'm going with them as a combined power couple at three. Two, got to go with Marie. We're seeing her really kind of you know assume kind of a leadership role within the gang and her powers seem to be getting expanded every episode so that's working well for her let's see where that goes but number one it's got to be indira give it up for dean shetty the master manipulator the other very quality double m getting it done she is definitely pretty goddamn scary man i have to say she's trying to cause some shit and uh it could be Ghostbuster style for them, man. And who knows, man? Maybe it'll be the biggest thing you hit New York City since the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. It, it really could be. Who's your top three? I cannot argue that at all. I hate to do this, but I'm going the exact same way, dude. I'm going the exact same way. I feel like you can't have Sam in there without Emma because she has some 
some level of, of ability to kind of work him right and 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 not control but like they're almost like a partnership now so to speak um and you got to put them together and and marie is so incredibly powerful we're seeing it more and more every episode um and she has to be in this but in deary right now is just on another level it, it was all fun and games when she was dealing with 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 uh uh you know dex knight and all that but now it's scary right so I, i'm going with the exact same for hate to do it mills but i can't think of anything else let's see if i can draw a difference between us better cameo or just who had do you have more fun with Soldier Boy or Tech Knight? Ooh. Tech Knight just because it was longer. That's what she said. Well, we can't do the college thing without handing out some grades. So Mills, on a scale of F minus all the way up to A plus, that's rare air up there. What grade are you giving to Jumanji, the sixth episode of Gen B? Well, I mean, you got... Joe Bluth and me, you know, he was trying to do a thing with bees. You got Jordan who can take a whole case of beam to the faith face. So I think I'm doing a B thing, but probably not the whole B thing. So uh B minus. Uh, again, just a little bit of a letdown. Felt like a little bit of a pit stop on the way to the fireworks factory. Did enjoy it a little bit more on the rewatch, but still hoping that they got some room to grow for the, the final two here. So B minus. Jamie G, go ahead and uh take the same grade I made. I got to take the exact same grade. I'm sorry, guys. I know you're out there listening. You're like, what is, what is with these We need to start guys? talking about just... these before we record. Yeah, we really do. I, I, you know what? I'll give it a B. I'll give it a solid B. Uh, I'm not uh, trying to look, guilt. It, we don't want a guilt B. Actually, though, in college, I would totally take a guilt B. So. You take a guilt B, dude. You'll take a guilt B any day of the week. Um, look, man, I think it's right in it's right in that neighborhood. Call it B minus, B, you know, B, B soft, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta have one or the other. You cannot head. It has to be a B minus or a B. I'm giving it a B. I'm giving it a B. Um and, and, and for all the same reasons, but I do think that it, it accomplished a lot in terms of background, backstory, and setting up. And I think we did get some big wow moments in this. Um, and then you know, Soldier Boy kind of pushed it from B minus to B uh for me. So that's it. Call it a B. Let's move on. Soldier Boy can push it real good. He can. That brings us to our predictions. Please be aware that we've both watched the teaser trailer at the end of the episode, and we'll be discussing that right here, right now. If you don't want to hear anything about that, go ahead and hit stop. Peace out, and we will see you next week. Thank you for checking us out. But before you peace out, like and subscribe. For everybody else, like and subscribe. And let's get into these predictions. Yeah, dude, the predictions. I think this is a pretty exciting teaser trailer. Let's go with one global thing before we get into the minutia. You know, Indira wants to weaponize the virus. What's her intent? Is she trying to gain power over the soups to control them? Or she literally wants to kill them all? You know, this is a tricky one for me. I've, I've, and I'm going to probably take a little bit of column A, column B. And, and, and what I'll say here, Mills, is I'm going to answer this with kind of a sidestep. I think whatever her her objective is, it's going to directly relate back to the mysterious nature of her daughter. Well, I I think her daughter is her motivation one way or the other. I totally buy that. Do you think that they're going to wrap up this virus plot by the end of this season? Or do you think it's going to carry over and do season four of The Boys? I, th I think it's going to bleed. I think it's going to bleed over, man. I think even if they kill the doc, even if they like, I, I just, I don't see her going away. And I, 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 I think this, I think this storyline is going to bleed over. I, I do. As far as the doc, here's my exact note. Dr. Cardosa does the typical change of heart, tells somebody just, you know, enough. So our heroes know about the virus and then he immediately gets killed. Any argument on any part of that? No, I think that's exactly spot on. I think, it, well, it, well, actually, the only thing I would say is he has a change of heart because he realizes that Indira is in it for like evil reasons. And it's not what he signed up to do this research on. And she's using it for, for negative re kind of, you know, all that kind of stuff. And that's why I think that's what it's going to boil down to. Are we going to get a thing where Kate has to go off her med so she can try to read minds again or something? It feels like they're setting that up a little bit, right? It, it definitely does. I mean, that was an interesting thing. You know, they, they mentioned the pills. 
I don't know, first or second or third episode or something um, with her and you didn't really think anything of it. So they've gone out of their way now to to show that it feels like it's got to come back around. I think that's a good way to, to have it come back around a little bit is she's going to, and I think ultimately she might end up sacrificing herself to redeem herself and save everyone else. Kind of, I think is what it's looking at. I, I still have her as my soup to, 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 to die out of this group, but I'll say Andre is approaching. It, it, she could live and Andre could die. Honestly, that wouldn't totally shock me either. All right, let's go to Andre, and we see him in the back of the ambulance in the scene, and the ambulance is bending, and he's fighting back. I'm going with he is uh, fighting his dad. Y- you think we're going to see Andre fight Polarity, fight his dad in the next, uh, you know, one of the next two episodes? I think we are. That would be really cool. That's a big wad to blow here in season one. It's like, guys, say, save some of this amazingness. For I say kill. Two, I said but... fight. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, no, I think it's, you're, you're right. And then that could come back into uh, into play season two. Uh, you know what, Mel? Sign me up for that. I'm there for it, man. Yeah. And how about Victoria Newman? Do you think she's really at Godolkin just to do like a town hall or a rally or something? Or do you think it has something to do with the virus? Well, I, I, knowing her, she's another one where we don't really know totally where her uh, motivation lies, so to speak. And what her intent is, um, I will say that you know the reference to you know Marie Moreau having a benefactor. Um, I, I think it may be that it's her, and I, I think I may have actually predicted that already. But I, I'm going to stand by that and say that it's that it's that it's her. She's the. Uh, you remember Cardoza asked for blood for Marie, and Indira said, "No, you're not the only one interested in her. She has a." Um, you know, she has a benefactor for the time being. So I, I, I think it's her. I think she's there. I think that's a big part of it. All right. I, I like that. And if she was there because of the virus, do you think she would be there to destroy the virus or to try to gain control of it for herself? Look, I think anybody that's that recognizes power and there's not a politician in the world that doesn't recognize the importance of power and that's not a political statement. It's just fact. I think they would question whether or not should I destroy it or should I keep it for myself to either use it or not, even if it's just to make sure no one else uses it. There's power that comes along with having this, right? This is a powerful, powerful, powerful development in the entire universe of the boys. This is probably the biggest development out of anything that we've seen in the entire universe of the boys, right? I'm going to say that she's at Godolkin University because there's some sort of riot breaking out because the kids now know about what's going on with Indira and she's lost complete control and they bring in the local politician to kind of, I'm going to say it has something to do with that. Well, she's running for Veep at this point. So this is a pretty big deal to get the vice presidential candidate. I would buy that. I would say that at least it, it, it's not a, just a town hall. There's no. some other ulterior motive. Let's at least put it that way. I think that that's pretty clear. And Victoria Newman seems like that kind of character, right? She doesn't do anything without an ulterior motive. All right, dude, how about Marie's blood? We got a whole thing where we saw Sam's blood being transfused into Luke. His blood is obviously powerful. We have Marie who's learning to get more control over blood. Is anything going to happen with this? They've been setting it up to where something has to happen, right? I mean, the mention of, I really want Marie's blood. We're seeing more and more of kind of this blood transfusion thing that happened in this episode. Uh, Marie, every episode's increasing her ability and her powers. I got to think something happens here. I don't know what, though, but I, I do think, if anything, it'll probably be used in an effort to 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 kind of stop or stall what's happening here. I could see Marie actually getting a chance to be a little bit of a hero here more than she's already been um, in this season to try to use her own blood to stop kind of the development of this virus once they get wind of it. All right. Uh, let me give you two options here. You can tell me either which one you think is more likely or which one you prefer or, or whatever, you know, predictions. We're just going to have a little bit of fun with it. Do you think Marie somehow uses Sam's blood to give it to other members of the gang maybe so they all go into like puppet world with sam to kind of like approximate his power and they just have there's a big scene where they all go into puppet mode and just destroy <laughs> everybody else or the other option 
She is Marie Moreau. Is that a reference to the Island of Dr. Moreau, the H.D. Wells novel, where it's basically a dude who makes all these hybrids and everything? Could she somehow take all of their blood and mix it together to make like some sort of like super, super soup? That would be so cool. I Man. Uh, Those are the two. Which would you rather prefer? Which is more likely? Whatever. Give me something. I'd prefer number two, but I think number one is more likely. You could combine them both. Like they turn into a super soup, but it's puppet, like Voltron style. So they form like a puppet super Voltron. Uh, yes. Dude, <laughs> pretty much anything with more puppets on there. Um, here's an interesting theory. And you can shut this down if you want. But what if Victoria Newman is actually Dean Shetty's daughter? If the ages work, that would be great. I, I think that's what we're looking for, right? If her daughter is going to show up, I think it almost has to be somebody we know. It doesn't really work otherwise. And it's hard to see who would be on the show because it's obviously not Kate and that was my only real contender. So then it almost has to be somebody from the boys. And there's not a lot of options other there. Anything else here on the prediction front, buddy? I think that's it. I, I just think that they've done a good job of building up enough so that we can have some fun predictions, right? Like we, We've gotten some character development, we've gotten some answers, but there's also still enough room to be able to make some fun predictions, and I like that. I think they've balanced it out well. And, and honestly, the, the, the trailer, if you guys haven't watched it, go watch it. It is It gets you fired up, man. I'm pretty pumped for these final two episodes. I, I think it's going to be um, two really good episodes. I'm hoping it's two best episodes of the season, and that that carries us into what we're, we're all excited about, which is season two. So it's going to be a fun ride. Thank you guys for checking out Compound B, joining us uh, right here on this incredible podcast. Make sure to join us next week on our next episode where we cover episode seven of Gen B titled Sick. Wow, dude, that's sick. Real excited Pretty sick, about bro. that, dude. That's gnarly, sick, all those good things. And hopefully that's how you feel about Compound B. You can find us wherever your pods on YouTube. Find us on social media at Compound B Pod. And if you think we were sick, don't forget the flaps. Follow, like, and please subscribe. Helps us out a lot. That's how we know that you know that you think we're sick in the good way. If you had fun, give us a thumb. That's all we're asking. I'm Megan Mills. He's Jamie G. That was Compound B. And you're in for a treat because you're going to find out what the B in Compound B stands for. It's Bueller. 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 Bueller.